So let me reassure you that what I'm about to, to say is pretty data free. And I hope should give you an opportunity really to, to relax and, and prepare for the evening. Now, we live in a civilized society. And the upside of civilization is that it develops science, it develops the arts, and it looks after the most vulnerable members of society. In terms of science, the 20th century has seen pretty dramatic advances in the biosciences. It started with the discovery of blood groups in 1901 and finished with the publication of data from the Human Genome Project in the millennium. And in between, we've seen a lot of major developments that have come out of the, out of the United Kingdom. The discovery and development of insulin, antibiotics, diuretics, beta blockers, and H2 blockers, both of which were discovered by the same British scientist who subsequently went on to win the Nobel Prize, James Black, the development of monoclonal antibodies, and all of these are drugs which are in common use today. In the physical sciences, we've made a major contribution as well during that, uh, that century. The discovery of the double helix using X-ray crystallography, the development of CT scanning, the development and discovery of uh, methodologies underpinning uh, the development of magnetic resonance imaging and magnetic resonance spectroscopy. In surgery, we've seen a bunch of major developments. In my specialty, the modernization of heart surgery due to the technical advances uh, uh, which were reflected in the, the heart-lung machine in the 1950s, particularly around Hansen Hospital, and ultimately to the sort of developments in robotic surgery which uh, Aradazi and others are developing. We've also seen the widespread uh, success of, of organ transplantation around the world. But I put it to you that surgery should be simply a stepping stone to simpler, often cheaper, but certainly less painful and less uh, invasive treatments. And there have been some dramatic examples of how surgery has, um, has contributed, if you like, and become a victim of its own success in some ways. Surgery for TB was eliminated with the discovery and application of streptomycin at the end of the first half of the last century. Surgery for stomach ulcers, which many of you would have been brought up on, was eliminated by a combination, effectively, of, of HD blockers and focused triple antibiotic therapy. But that's all kind of small fry stuff in many respects because effective healthcare, in my view, is about prevention rather than treatment. If you wanted to be really cynical, you could argue that the size, magnitude, and, uh, and grandeur of our tertiary care and secondary care hospitals is simply a barometer of the failure of our primary care uh, prevention strategies. In my view, Two of the most important developments on a global scale in terms of prevention have been the discovery of the polio vaccine and the eradication of smallpox. And what makes these particularly interesting is that they brought together a combination of basic science, public health, and effective global health strategies underpinned by political endeavor. And that's quite a complex mix of things. The, there are other examples. Fluoridation in this country has transformed the dental health of our citizens from a generation ago when many people would expect to be a dentist by the age of 50 to now a young generation who think of filling as a pretty rare thing. The threat of AIDS, which not long ago was a lethal condition, has been transformed to a long-term condition by the effective application of basic science coupled with um, uh, appropriate pharmaceutical development. I think that the next big challenge that we have to face in the world Malaria. And that is going to be another example of where basic science, global strategies, uh, politics, and public health come together to, to, uh, to focus on one area. In terms of the vulnerable, which is one major aspect of a civilized society, I believe that a civilized society should look after those at the extremes of age, the neonates and the elderly those of physical, mental, or learning disabilities, and those at the lower extreme end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And I put it to you that, in the eyes of many people in this country, the NHS is the icon that represents the civilization of our society. Indeed, Andrew Bevan, in 1948, said that it was the pinnacle of, uh, of 
civilization. And I think in those days, it was many people would argue now that we may have slipped. But I put it to you again that we have a great opportunity now uh, to move our NHS forward. Interestingly, the NHS was born in very hard times. It was born out of World War II, where personal tragedy, community hardship coalesced into an international social conscience. The war had offered hardship, but it had offered full employment, and most notably, particularly as a result of the Blitz, it had offered free medical care to non-combatant and combatant casualties as well. That meant that after the war, social expectations were high, and there were expectations of a new social order. But when you look back at those times, they were extremely hard. We may think that we're in hard times now, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But the first three months of 1947, that's the year before the NHS was founded, there was a winter of exceptional severity. You may start to see some common features. There was rationing of food, and there was a scarcity of fuel. That's in the first three months. The fourth month saw the heaviest floods for 53 years, which killed thousands of sheep and lambs, and threatened the, uh, the sowing of crops and the prospects of a subsequent good harvest in the summer. The fifth month saw an economic crisis, particularly in respect to the dollar, which ended up in worse restrictions than had been seen at any time during the war. Bread had to be rationed for the first time. It wasn't rationed in the war. By September, the meat ration was reduced. In October, the bacon ration was halved. And in November, potatoes were rationed. That all resulted in a steep rise in the cost of foodstuffs, which accentuated, if you like, the divide between the haves and the have-nots at the time. And that was also coupled with poor harvests in Europe, which further drove up the, uh, the, the cost of food. So it was really tough compared to what we're seeing now. And in all probability, if a universal, free at the point of service, uh, healthcare had not been established then, it would probably never and I think the thesis that I'm trying to make behind this um, analogy is that there is a tendency to think that when the going gets rough, that is not the time to change complex organizations. But it is quite clear from that that change can be incubated by, by hardship. And we now have an NHS which is an, an icon of a, of a proud national social conscience. So that's the upside of the life of society, of a civilized society. But there is quite a remarkable and strong downside, and that is financial greed. We are now entering, or are in, the worst economic crisis since the war, probably since the 1930s. 80% of our gross domestic product is being used to pay off our national debt. I think it was of the order of 40% at the end of the war. So we are in a very, very bad financial position. What that means is that in terms of the amount of money that is available now for public services, that is dramatically reduced because a large portion of it is now being used to help to pay interest on the national debt. So instead of enjoying sustained growth financially that we've seen in the public sector, we're now going to see that there is less money around, and even after special pleading for education and health, it is likely that over the next three to six years, the amount of money that's available for expenditure on the NHS will remain relatively constant. Now that's fine, but the problem is that demand for the NHS will continue to increase at an unabated rate. In the past, over the past 10 years, we've seen a growth rate of money into the NHS of about 5% per year. So when we talk about having a constant amount of money, that's quite a big virtual reduction, particularly when you consider that demand will continue to grow at the rate that it has over the last decade. And that will translate, if you like, into us having to do more for less. And the virtual gap <coughs> between the amount of money available and the, um, and the amount of work we have to do will be about 20 billion pounds over the next three years. 
So if we continue doing what we do now in the same way, we're going to have to effectively reduce our services to the tumor. <coughs>